Um, this is a fantastic panel. I have to say, if we spent, if I had all the guys actually list what they've done, um, we'd be up here for half of the session just going through what all of our backgrounds are. Myself, uh, my name is Sasha Borsma. I'm an independent business analyst and consulting producer for the uh, interactive conversion and gaming sectors. I also try to maintain a blog, uh, bewareoftheleopard.ca, which discusses uh, the business of interactive digital media production in Canada. And I'm also an instructor and researcher uh, for Centennial College in interactive digital media. And our panel, I've got them in order here, but they're in different seating arrangements. So just put up your hand as I go. Uh, we have Alex Jansen, who's the head of Pop Sandbox, an award-winning multimedia production and publishing company with a focus on original projects rooted in graphic novel and film. Recent project is the, is, uh, the Next Day, which is done in collaboration with the NFB and TV Ontario. The graphic novel was featured in the New York Times uh, uh, reading list this summer and is also the interactive experience itself was nominated for an IFA award later this month, or month which is uh, late announced later this month, isn't it? Yeah, in competition. Excellent. Right next to Alex is Tony Walsh, who's the founder and creative director of Phantom Compass, which is an independent game studio that develops its own titles and collaborates with other screen-based media producers to adapt their IP into games and interactive experiences. Tony's also been on a variety of mentorship and advisory roles for organizations like the CBC, Achilles Media, the Bay Area Video Coalition Producers Institute, AFTRS, and South by Southwest. Then we have Jim, who's right next to me. And Jim is an indie culture maker in various mediums, including graphic novels, movies, and games. He has helped found a variety of arts organizations, including the Perpetual Motion Roadshow and the Toronto-based Hand-Eye Society. He wrote his own interactive non-fiction work called Game Developers Conference The Game, which has been described as a game that, quote, manages to capture quite accurately the collaborative, socially supportive, and intellectually curious aspects of what it's like to actually be there. More about him at nomediakings.org. And then on the far end of the table there is David Fono, who is the co-founder of Atmosphere Industries, which is an award-winning pervasive and urban gaming collective. Unlike our other panelists whose work is in the digital space, David and his team develop games that utilize and reflect aspects of the everyday world. One of his recent award-winning games, Gentrification the Game, was a theatrical street game that used site-specific gameplay to create light-hearted commentary on the site itself. Gentrification was featured at festivals in Canada, the US, UK, and Germany. So, thank you guys. Yay. Uh, one thing with games, when we think of, first thought we always have with games are things like Call of Duty, Halo, and these, you know, first person shooters tend to come up, or games like Farmville, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the reality is coming out of the game sector is all of us as professionals are a little bored and tired of some of the same repetitiveness and much like the heart of, of the reason why filmmakers move into documentary and social docs uh, is much the same as what's driving the gaming sector into this space as well. Um, it's actually uh, it's quite a common thread within game studios, sorry, back up. It is so common in the industry uh, to discuss things like social games that the Game Developers Conference, which is one of the major events um, for our industry, for years has had a, a, a stream called Serious Games, which this year is actually called Games for Change. And it's being led by a number of game developers who want to do something a little bit more meaningful with their talent, very much like many of you as documentary filmmakers. One of the game developers out of the US that I know I often look at as, as one of the leaders um, is a woman by the name of Brenda Brathwaite. And she's worked on a number of AAA titles, but she's been looking at games that um, evoke emotion. Uh, looking at film and television, people, they, they see something that, and, and they, they respond to it emotionally. It makes them cry, it makes them laugh, and she's been exploring how it is in games. So she's been taking board games and doing art series of taking um, these significant historic moments uh, and turning them into a gameplay experience. Her most famous one is called Train, which was about the Holocaust, and they're little wood figures that you put on a train and you know play cards and they move back and forth. When you didn't know about it, um, they just assumed as this characters on a train. Halfway through the game, users realized that they were all the characters were actually representative of um, the people that were sent to camps like Auschwitz. And what happened when the first few times it was played, people got really angry and upset about this because how could a game be so manipulative uh, was actually what the response was by some people. And in her case, she actually thought this was a good thing 
that by playing a game, you felt a part of the experience and felt that it was something meaningful. Um, and her and there's a number of other others out of the U.S. like Jane McGonigal, et cetera, who have been exploring this in, uh, in many different ways. So using that as our anchors, well, we've got this panel of a variety of different uh, games and examples. And the first person that we'll have do some examples of inspirational projects and how it relates to his own work is Tony. Yeah, of course, I'll put you on the far end. <laughs> uh, and then, um, sadly, we'll have to reach over here and grab a computer. Right, so um, I actually got introduced to the whole idea of documentary games uh, as part of the Bay Area Video Coalition uh, in San Francisco's program called the Producers Institute, uh, which I joined in 2007, and I think uh, it may be done at this point, but they ran uh, six iterations of it. Uh, the format may be familiar to some of you. It's basically like a week of intense, uh, uh, teams come in um, and work intensely for about five or six days. At the end of it, they present uh, a 10 minute presentation that combines their original documentary idea with some interactive um, opportunities. They pitch that to uh, funders and, uh, and potential partners. Um, so through that program, I've uh, been involved in mentoring uh, a bunch of different teams um, on some pretty interesting subjects, which I wrote down so I wouldn't forget. Um, the history of video games, uh, the US criminal court system, uh, human trafficking, uh, Iraqi refugees resettlement, uh, forced evictions in South Africa, and uh, ecological cleanup in Kashmir. Uh, so these are all subjects that had games attached to them, not exactly the kind of thing you would naturally think of when you think of gaming. I'm just going to quickly show um, one of the, let's see if I can actually find it here, one of the... It's in the safari on the far right. Well, no, it's, it's, it's inside there, it's just a different header. Inside what? The McDonald's one. Oh. Thank you. There you go. Sorry, I'm actually a PC guy. <laughs> These Macs really confuse me. And let's just see if I can find the project that I worked on. You can find these all on the Bayback um, website. They have all the previous Producers Institute projects uh, on their site. Bayback's Producers Institute connects independent documentary filmmakers and their socially relevant content to new participatory models of storytelling, collaborating with some of the world's leading tech developers, NGO advocates, and visionary social entrepreneurs. Producers design and build new interactive transmedia tools to support real civic engagement and global social change. refugees on their journey. They were threatened by militias for collaborating with the U.S. So their only way to really survive is leaving their home and coming here. But then the struggle continues. I can do a shelter referral for you. That's all I can do for you. أصدقائي <تصفيق> وهذه الإله أنا أحبها كثير وأعتز بها لأنها تمثل الحرية من باب الحرية more than 30,000 Iraqi refugees here. Thousands of them already face homelessness and hunger. I mean, they didn't imagine they'd live in a mansion or a big house, but at least live a decent life where they can work, provide for their families, and uh, be able to rebuild their lives. We decided to do a game that's called Hala Hello. Hala is the Iraqi way of saying hello. It's a voice-driven, location-aware game. The project really is an attempt to uh, bring two 
two different worlds together. Um, the American and the Iraqis. You know, what a family goes through when their food stamps are cut off and they can't get halal food for their children. They start to appreciate what they have, but also understand what it means for people who sacrificed everything to help us in the war in Iraq. <laughs> The film is centered around specific subjects and for the game we wanted to sort of stylize a little bit. We're using subjects that are fictitious but based on real stories. Hello my friend, my name is Ziad from Baghdad. I had to leave Iraq and come to Virginia because the insurgents shot my parents. They wanted to punish me for working as a translator in the US Army. Is this refugee's life in your hands? Like, are you responsible for them in some way? We kind of started to boil it down, and you know, why is why are you trying to tell this story? And what emerged out of it was something that was more local, that could run over the course of a week, and people could experience a parallel life almost. They could experience these things from these refugees who were displaced. The project is web-based, but it has a strong mobile component, and the players of the game will take into their companionship a recent Iraqi refugee and experience the story of this person as they go through their everyday lives. So the gameplay actually comes out from the web and gets distributed via mobile devices. I'm rebuilding my life here. I need your help. You'll be prompted to enter your number, and at that point, the game will start. You're bound to that person, so he'll be um, calling you to share with you tidbits of their life. Hala, I'm Ziad. My wife Hannah and me are expecting our first baby in two months. I am so excited. I wish we had family or more friends around here to share this with. Do you want to help? A player might be at the grocery store, and um, if they have the iPhone app open, they'll, they'll get a call from the character, and the character will be talking about problems that they have with food. My American neighbors are very kind, bringing us food, because we lost our food stamps. But the food has pig in it, and we are Muslim. But I don't want to hurt their feelings. Can you explain this to my neighbor? Yes or no? The player will be able to uh, experience some good parts of uh, an Iraqi refugee's life as well. Our main character uh, is expecting. His wife is seven months pregnant. It's like an unfolding drama and from these different characters in various locations, and it just takes you on this wild ride. There's a time frame and the clock is ticking. Can we meet the challenge of helping this person, you know, reach his goal, whether it be, you know, finding a job, finding a community that can be more supportive and help and embrace them? The stories culminate in an invitation to go to the live event that will be staged as a way to get the players of the game to meet actual Iraqi refugees. When you're doing something for social good, as a game designer, you may not know what the best actions are to take. One of the things we thought was donate money. That's, that's an easy, easy thing to ask people for. But when talking to the NGO, she said what they really need are volunteers. The NGO that's partnering with this project is the um, U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants. Our organization protects the rights and needs of refugees, so helping refugees establish lives in the United States when they first arrive. What excites me about the project is that it's a game, but it can also be a tool to do outreach to people who might be willing to help Iraqi refugees. The best thing that it could do down the line is help Iraqis in countries that they have fled to, like Syria and Lebanon and Jordan, to eventually learn about what life in the United States is like. I think that that'll be an incredible tool to train and prepare people. Beyond war, beyond differences, it just brings people together. This my family now. <laughs> and that's my family because uh, uh, now I have no hide the uh, family, you family. Projects that went through that institute and uh, had games attached to them, um, and that's my show. Don't. Oh, well. um, 
Um, sure. Uh, yeah. Right. So since working on uh, a bunch of these different projects, I actually developed uh, an interest in the combination of uh, uh, games and, and documentary, at least in terms of um, the veracity of documents uh, as it pertains to gameplay. It sort of sounds like a, a weird um, pairing, I suppose, but. Uh, just uh, as an academic uh, legitim legitimization, uh, there's a researcher out in, uh, at Concordia University uh, by the name of Cindy Foremba who actually spoke with me, uh, I think it might even have been in this room, it was a couple of years back, uh, about documentary games and her contention is that documentary games actually have to have a document in them. There have to be documents as part of the gameplay. Um, and I kind of thought that was cool. And um, so one of the games we're working on right now, um, it's kind of a transmedia property. Oh my goodness, how do I maximize a window on a Macintosh? <laughs> you, know what? you know what, never mind. Um, so uh, we're working on a, a learning game about Greek drama. Uh, in the game, uh, there's going to be a bunch of um, documents uh, and document, uh, documentation relating to the characters in the game. And as you work your way through the game, you begin to assemble pieces um, of these stories of these characters in a way that seems very realistic. So it'd be like actual, actual hospital records, uh, actual websites, uh, and things that really feel real and seem realistic, even though the world that this takes place in is very uh, fantastic and nightmarish. Um, so sort of taking um, some of those ideas that uh, were seeded through with some of the projects I worked on at Bayback and uh, an in independent study and kind of working them into a game environment. So that's sort of um, a game we've, we did a prototype of in 2009. We're hoping any week now we'll hear about funding uh, coming through uh, to do uh, a full version of it. So uh, yeah, that's it. Excellent. And Jim, what are, I know that for two year example, you did tech support probably, but can you talk about you know what you're looking at as an inspiration for documentary games and also what are you working on? Sure. Um, uh, has anybody uh, played the game September 12th? Anybody? Nobody? Okay. Okay. <laughs> One of the panelists. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, okay, so I'll give you a brief, I mean, this game is, it's, it's quite an old game. It's so old, in fact, that as, as was saying, modern computers have trouble playing it. But basically, um, it, it's a kind of, um, it's a top-down kind of uh, view of uh, a village um, in the Middle East, uh, and it's, it's, um, you have basically a kind of a, um, uh, a little bit of a um, crosshair that you kind of like can put over the, the people running between the, the, the buildings and such. And the object is to, is to kill the terrorists. And their terrorists look like this. But the terrorists are surrounded by, of course, civilians. And you have a very big gun. So um, when you uh, end up shooting one of the terrorists, um, unless you, you're incredibly lucky, you end up uh, having um, sort of uh, collateral da damage and, um, and killing some um, people around you uh, or people around that, that terrorist um, who, who sort of attract in a procedural level um, a bunch of, uh, a bunch of uh, people who are mourning and after the crying stops they turn into terrorists. So there's this idea of like, it basically it's kind of an unwinnable game because you're, you're constantly um, you know, trying, you know, trying to, to, uh, to sort of uh, take, uh, take out the terrorists, but you, you, can't, you can't help but kill a few civilians. And to me, it was a great kind of, um, it was a great kind of way to kind of um, uh, look at kind of the, it's a sort of metaphor for um, maybe war isn't the best solution. Maybe the biggest guns isn't necessarily the best way to, to kind of uh, deal with this problem. Um, and I thought it did it in a very, a very kind of um, uh, systemic way. And that's one of the kind of um, inspirations for, for me in, in, at first getting involved with um, uh, sort of serious games, documentary style games, is that um, you, you, you aren't necessarily feeding them um, uh, the, 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 the player a kind of um, political idea. Um, they're kind of uh, working through a system that you set up and, and sort of understanding the system and, and the, the pros and cons of the system um, in a way that is, is uh, deeper than simply telling them your political perspective. And I think for documentary makers, um, one kind of thing to, to sort of think about is um, like the, the kind of how, how sort of transformative that idea of, of show don't tell is. Um, because if you just tell somebody something, um, you don't engage their brain in the same way. If you use visual storytelling and visual kind of um, kind of constructions to sort of uh, to sort of d display some of the things that you, that you're looking to, to 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 sort of get across in your documentary and involve the the viewer, uh, it's so much more powerful. 
And I would like to say for games, basically um, the same way that, um, uh, that showing is greater than telling, uh, interacting is even greater than showing to a certain extent. Because there's another, another um, uh, more active level uh, that people have to get into um, to actually interact with the system you've set up. Um, and the fact that they, can, that, they, that, that they can kind of come out of it with their own realizations um, and come to their own conclusions in that way uh, makes it much more, much more powerful. Um, so, um, and then what are you currently working on? Okay. So, uh, all the stuff I said about how, um, it, what inspired me originally to get involved with, um, um, with serious games, um, I, I uh, struck up a friendship with uh, Paolo from Molly Industria. Um, we had him to uh, actually speak at our uh, first uh, hand eye social. Um, a few years back, and we sort of uh, started collaborating on a, on a project. Now, this project, unlike some of his earlier projects, which I, I believe um, Alex is going to sort of show us, um, it's not a kind of, uh, it's not a systemic kind of uh, depiction of something. It's actually a much more kind of um, uh, uh, sort of individual um, and, and sort of a personal kind of uh, role playing kind of thing that. Uh, that uh, he's inviting us to do in this project. Um, it's called Unmanned. Um, I'm just, it's a two and a half minute video I'm just gonna play uh, that, and I, I basically, my contribution is I'm the writer on it, um, and Paolo has done all the sort of hard things. game about a day in the life of a drone pilot. The main character lives in Las Vegas, Nevada with a wife and young son. Every day he commutes to the Creech Air Force Base one hour north of the city where most of the American armed drones are operated. <laughs> His typical day is rendered as a series of episodes that function as mini-games. Every episode presents a dual screen similar to two-channel video and offers a corresponding dual gameplay. Players are required to split their attention to manage parallel tasks, such as controlling an unmanned aerial vehicle and having a mundane conversation with the character. This unusual gameplay evokes the disjointed psychological state of a man who's conducting a normal suburban life while remotely fighting on the other side of the world. Unmanned employs a linear structure but, at the same time, provides a high degree of agency that makes every session unique. The player takes an active role in the exploration and development of the character and is confronted with moral dilemmas and complex choices. In Unmanned, the language and iconography of video games is playfully subverted into a hybrid storytelling device that aims to investigate 21st century warfare and its relationship with electronic entertainment. It's uh, very optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's actually uh, going to be presented, I think, for the first time at uh, Sundance uh, kind of showcase of um, where we're going to be showing uh, a lot of Paolo's uh, work, um, past work, and, and this new work as well. So next up, Alex. What's cool and what you working on? So yeah, so we were just we were all asked to talk about um, a project that was an inspiration for us, and there's actually a ton of inspirational work right now. Um, I find especially in the gaming sector, there's, it's hard to, to choose one really. 
Um, I was hoping to touch in actually into the McDonald's game, but I think you've actually covered a little bit in, in, um, in the panel yesterday. So, so Richard uh, Lackman went, went through a lot, of the, a lot of that game. So I was going to look at one specifically called uh, Passage, which is by Jason Rohrer. And I think even just the fact that it's a, a single author is, is kind of what's exciting to me about it as well, because I think that uh, it reminds me of the way I felt about film in, in the early 90s, where all of a sudden the technology was becoming more affordable and people were able to really kind of uh, get in and, and do completely different things with the media. And, I, and, I, and that's kind of what the way, the way I, I feel this is pretty exciting, is that you've got, you've got one guy who's completely uh, able to author his own piece. So at its core, and this is kind of what I love about it, is it, it's, it's deceptively simple and, it, and it's um, really iconic to like the old games that, that uh, I would have played. Uh, for sure, with the old 8-bit old Nintendo stuff. Um, and this is, this is basically the player. The whole game, it's, it's a five minute game. You're starting on the, on the left side. You've got your, your character here and you're kind of moving along. And, and on the right hand side, you can, you can see kind of what, what lies ahead for the character as you continue to, to go as you move through it. And you've got this kind of uh, arbitrary score going on here. And if you, if you proceed along the, the front line, there's absolutely no obstacles. <coughs> and you just continue, your, your, your score goes up. Uh, for the further you go along. Um, and as you move along, your character starts to age. And now you kind of move towards the, the center section. Um, and instead of moving along the, cro uh, along the top where there's no obstacles, if you start to go down, you start to go into this kind of complex maze. And in the maze, uh, you'll find different, different um, objects. You'll find like a treasure chest or whatnot. Uh, and, and when you get the, some of them, there'll, there'll be a, a, a prize inside and your score will go up. Sometimes there isn't. And you continue to kind of maneuver through the game. And what you start to see here is on the left-hand side, you, you, you can kind of see where you've been a little bit more as your characters move to the middle, and now you can see a little bit less of where you're going. And then towards the end, your, your character's essentially all the way to the right-hand side. Uh, this is like coming up to the five-minute mark, and, and your character's now uh, essentially an old man, and you can see kind of all behind you, but you can't really see a ton, a ton in front. <coughs> and then uh, at the five-minute mark, no matter when you're playing, your, your character dies. And it, to me, it was the most confusing thing the first time that I played it, not, not having a ton of context. It was actually introduced to me, actually through, uh, Jim, Jim set me up with a uh, fellow Mark Rabo who, who uh, runs GamerCamp. And he didn't give me a ton of context to it. And I, I played through it, and I thought it was, and it's also got this kind of beautiful, beautiful soundtrack. But what you start to go into as, as you play through it again, and you start to realize, and, and then also when you go in and you see kind of his, his artist statement that he kind of created it as a metaphor for life. And for, for him, <coughs> I think he, in, in his statement, and this is all online, you could just go to Jason Rohrer and, and, and Google Passage and it would be a fantastic uh, game to pull up. But you'll, you'll read his artist statement and it was, you know, he's coming up to 30, he'd had a friend who just, who just passed away, and kind of looking at a lot of different things in, in, uh, in life and, and how kind of, and, and I, I love some of the beauty of it, within the game context, you've got this score, but ultimately, you know, no matter how far you go, it doesn't matter how high your, your score goes, it's uh, ultimately at the end, five minutes, you, you die. You start seeing that as you go across the front, there's absolutely no obstacles. You'll get incredibly far into the into the future, uh, but if you go down, it gets increasingly more difficult. But there's these these rewards, and you don't know if they're necessarily what you know what the payoff will be. Um, and as you move through it the second time through, it, I start moving through it, and, and you find this girl. And as soon as you find the girl, now you're walking two of you together uh, side by side. So now your score is actually doubling for every step that you take along along the front. But what happens is if you try to move further down into the maze, there's, there's prizes like, you know, here's a treasure chest you, you can't actually get to. You can't access if there's two of you. So there's things that you could only do by, your, by yourself that you, <coughs> you can't do, and yet you have this kind of larger, larger score. And then as you, as you move ahead, uh, perhaps the saddest thing is, is that uh, you know, before the five minute mark, the, 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 the woman dies, and then you've got this kind of uh, crumpled over, bent over old man who just kind of wanders around for the last 20, 30 seconds. And it's probably one of the most de depressing things that you can get. Um, but it's, it's, it's absolutely beautiful what he's been able to do in, in such a, in, in a medium and completely subverting it in, in a new way. You start to look at things and then even, you know, um, a lot of stuff he gets into is, you know, at the start of life, you can see your entire life ahead of you and you've got all these different places to go. And, and by the end, you know, at the end of this life bar, all you can see is kind of the past behind you. And you can sometimes see these obstacles ahead, ahead or, but you can't necessarily get to them. And I just thought it was such a, a beautiful piece that he was able to achieve in, in a, in a five-minute um, five window. And he's, he's done a lot of single author work since. And so it wouldn't be documentary, but I just thought it really spoke to, to the potential of uh, video games to be doing something completely different um, and stunning. 
And so <clears throat> I guess that would be one, one big inspiration. September 12th was, was a, a, again, something I just thought stunning for, for making cause and effect. And then, I, I mean, I won't go into it again, but, but Richard spoke a bit about uh, the McDonald's game, which, which uh, the fellow that uh, Jim's partnering with was also kind of consulting on, on the new project we're working on as a creator of. And, and it's, uh, it's incredible. It's like working with, uh, basically makes these interconnections within, within the, the food industry. And as you're starting to go, you're kind of toggling between different screens, and, and you, you know, at the, at one level, you, you're kind of you're managing, you're, you're choosing whether how you're going to use these fields, whether you're going to be for, for soy production or for cow production, and then you have to toggle to to the the abattoir where now they're running out of meat, so you need to produce more meat, and then you can go back and well, you can produce faster by maybe adding adding you know hormones, and you start to see all these different a effects as you're going along. It's a beautiful kind of satirical way. Um, and you're, you're kind of toggling then to the storefront and then to the head office and it makes these really complex interconnections and I think that's what I'm really excited about with video games. You're able to make these incredibly complex uh, connections very simple and it actually takes me more time probably to explain the game than it would for you to, uh, to play it. But I think through the process of playing it, it would actually become more intuitive and, and much more visceral. So I guess with, with those kinds of things in, in mind, and also being really excited about a lot of the stuff that, that uh, Jim's been driving with, with the Hand-Eye Society, and this whole kind of movement where Toronto's got this incredible indie gamer community, um, I'm really interested in kind of going a little bit more in, into some of the, the, the retro stuff. So I guess the, in, in this case, we, we did a, a longer presentation about, about uh, Pike Trouble uh, earlier on. Today, so I'll just hit on it briefly, um, but uh, Paul Schertz, who's the, the producer of, of uh, Trouble in the Peace, which is a documentary film dealing with, with what's been going on, similar to Gasland or Weebo's War, where you've got this kind of uh, exploitation of resources. You've got you know, these, these areas in which, in which you can set fire to the, to the water coming out of your, out of your taps, and uh, you've got the, the basically with the, the fracking happening too close to homes, and then you've got families getting sick, you've got cattle getting sick, leading to protesters, and, it's ultimately led to, to pipe bombing and this whole kind of tearing up of a community. And Trouble in the Peace is looking at Peace River specifically out of the West Coast, but the idea was to kind of to explore those same issues within a video game framework. Again, trying to make those kind of uh, fast and quick connections. <coughs> so the underlying mechanic, uh, so this would be, I guess, somewhat of an inspiration, uh, but more so just kind of the underlying uh, gameplay that we're, we're playing with is a game called Pipe Dream, um, which we talked about a bit earlier. It's, it was, again, a single author game from uh, 1989. Uh, John Dale, who created it, and it might be familiar to people. It, uh, it was on every version of Windows 3.1, um, and it moved like four million copies. It was, it was kind of like an arcade classic, contemporary to Tetris, where you're just uh, basically you're given these randomly, randomly assigned um, pieces of pipe that are coming down, and what you need to do is make a connection from a start point to an end point, um, and as you're making this kind of pipeline, then, then all of a sudden the, the sludge starts going, starts going through it. And the idea here was to take that same uh, mechanic and, and basically to subvert it in that now you're, you're basically playing the same game, but now you're playing it over top of, of, uh, of community. Essentially, in the, the early levels, it's forest, and then you move into, into farmland, and then eventually you're moving into kind of like a rural community. And this is just kind of a compressed, we did, we did a whole gameplay walkthrough. But in this case, you start seeing some of the things. You know, you've got like your, your, your leak, which has led to the cattle dying, which has led to the protesters coming in and, and needing to build around the protesters and pipe bomber. So as you actually play through this, you start getting these whole kind of uh, connections of what's going on. But again, similar to a lot of, uh, a lot of things, by putting the, the game, uh, the, the, I guess the player, into the controlling role, it doesn't immediately vilify industry. You're essentially creating this pipeline um, and weighing the, the, the constraints of, of your big oil and gas rep who's pushing you to do you know, the fastest, most direct route using the least pipe against kind of the, 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 the environment. And you kind of see both both uh, both sides of the piece and how it all plays together. So that would be Pipe Trouble. Excellent. And so while these three guys are uh, predominantly focused on like the electronic game side, and I know that David also comes from the, you know, the, the software gaming side, uh, he's actually been starting to explore more experiential games. I'm not sure if there's, I don't think there's a link or anything. Sure. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the great thing about the, oh. uh, the Toronto Games community. Everyone's like happy and sharing and wants to help. That's very cute. Uh, but David works in an entirely different space with activist gaming, and we thought he'd be a fantastic addition just to kind of blow your minds open and do a totally different way of looking at the game experience. So. Yeah, I mean, I should uh, I should point out that like yeah, I I I'm I'm big into the Toronto gaming community. And I I love video games and board games and all that. But where I have really actually taken my inspiration from. 
with regards to uh, to uh, the kind of work we're doing in the activist uh, and issue-based space uh, is is more on the end of these uh, what are called pervasive games. Um, so I, I got into this space originally um, by going to a festival uh, called Come Out and Play, which is in New York and San Francisco. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of similar festivals around the world. Uh, so there's uh, Igfest uh, and Hide and Seek in England, a few other smaller ones there. There's uh, Invisible Playground in, in Berlin, and I'm, I'm probably forgetting, uh, forgetting a few. Uh, and uh, I, I've spent the last couple of years visiting these different festivals, and um, it's really gotten, uh, I'm gonna talk about what I'm, what I'm doing now, but that, that really has, has strongly informed um, what we're doing, what we're doing now, and the way we approach dealing with issues in games. So, what was uh, a quick overview of the, what these festivals are like? So, so pervasive games is, is a is a very broad term, um, but it essentially means uh, any game that uh, isn't played uh, on a particular uh, platform. So, not video games, not board games. So, these these festivals have a mix of everything from. Uh, variations on hopscotch to iPhone adventure games to uh, there's a game that groups of people had to dance across an intersection in Times Square. Uh, just a really wide variety of things. And uh, what's interesting about these festivals also is that uh, they have a lot of um, they have a lot of intersection with the Games for Change community. This last year, come out and play in New York partnered with uh, Games for Change um, uh, to to uh, produce some games that were both part of Game for Change and also part of the Come Out and Play Festival. People like Jay McGonigal and Ian Bogos who do a lot of you know, persuasive gaming type stuff. They featured games um, at, at, at Come Out and Play several times. Uh, so there's, a, there's the people who are making these festivals, uh, are, they, they, they themselves are, seem to be very strongly motivated um, by, by issues and in particular issues around public space and urban planning. And I was never really interested around, uh, around these, about these. Uh, issues until I went to these festivals, and all of a sudden that really got me interested in urban planning and and uh, and public space issues. And uh, it, I asked myself, you know, what what was it about um, going to these that that was so effective at, at engaging me in this way? And I started to realize that it's these festivals are less about showcasing games uh, and creating games than they are about creating playgrounds. Uh, and that's sort of what we're trying to do these days at the atmosphere. Uh, we don't, we're not really trying to create games, we're trying to play, create playgrounds. So it's a, it's a bit of a subtle distinction. Um, so I guess first of all, uh, I should mention the distinction between games and play, which is a pretty controversial thing. Uh, there's a lot of academic rigmarole around it. But I mean, basically, uh, you know, game is sort of a manifestation of play. Play is more of this um, uh, unbounded, Freeform thing, less focused on goals and more focused on exploration, experimentation, uh, and experience. And so, what was interesting about these festivals was that you know there were games, but even the games themselves, they're very experimental. And people aren't really there just to play the game. They're not there to win. No one really cares about winning at the games at these festivals. Everyone is there because they're interested in uh, they're interested in in messing around. Uh, and trying out new things, and it's a, there's a really strong sense of community in terms of uh, in terms of uh, giving feedback and and and, and uh, developing these games and, and coming up with new games. Even the people who just show up to play them, so they're not all game designers. Um, just the players show up, and they're really invested in the idea of doing of, of trying out new things and doing new things and coming up with new things as they're playing these games, uh, and so. <clears throat> Uh, a good example of this is actually something Hide and Seek uh, is doing. So they're in London, and they are, are making a business out of this. Uh, and they, um, they were commissioned to create a bunch of tiny games uh, along this strip of uh, highly touristy uh, area on the South Bank in London. And these games themselves, the, the games themselves are, uh, are, are pretty trivial. These are fit into the, the variations on, on Hopscotch. But these are games, there's, about, there's like seven of them and they're just distributed uh, across the pavement. So the rules are on the pavement, the game space is on the pavement. You can walk up to it, you can encounter it and play it. And so the point isn't really that there's a game in front of you. The point is that there's a whole bunch of games all throughout this space. And so it encourages 
uh, people walking around to view the space in a different way. The original idea was creating a game that actually just made people uh, do positive things in, uh, in an area, in a space. So we have the game involves uh, protests that had signs that say like smile more, the game involves giving up flowers to people, giving candies to people, uh, it has parades that say happy neighbor day. Uh, so the game was really just an excuse to get people doing these things that we thought would be really fun for people, to, uh, for, for spectators, uh, and, and, and good for the neighborhood in general. And by having the game and people playing the game, they're not going through a simulation of that experience, they're actually doing that experience. Uh, so that takes us, I guess that, that, that takes me to what we're doing now. Uh, we're working um, on a project uh, funded by the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada called Gaming Privacy. Uh, and the idea is to create a game that's gonna teach kids about online privacy skills and we're actually working with kids to do this. But the approach we're taking isn't to create a game that simulates going online and being attacked by predators online. And in fact, the feedback we got from the OPC was that kids hate that stuff. Like, if you give them a game that's going to be like, no, kids, we're going to teach you about how to stay safe online, they just immediately shut off. So they were really looking for a game that didn't do that. And that was encouraging to us. And what we've done, what we're currently working on, it's a game, we're making a game that has, on the surface, it has nothing to do with online privacy. It's, a, it's an adventure, uh, mystery, detective uh, game. Um, but it, uh, it, it forces the players to make trust assessments. So we sort of pared down the concept of uh, behind online privacy. What are the broad skills you need to be safe online? We realize that's, that's really about trust. It's really about knowing who to trust and having the tools to figure out who you can trust and what the trade-offs are uh, yeah, uh, uh, when you decide to trust um, an, an organization online. And so how can we best help kids develop those skills? Uh, well, we can create a game that makes them have the experience of making trust assessments. Um, and so I guess we're, it's, it's kind of like uh, kind of sneaking the, edge of the pedagogical content in through the back door uh, so that uh, they're learning. but. Um, but they don't know it because the skills are so broad that, uh, that they're not tied to, to you know, that, that particular domain that they've been told about um, uh, a million times by parents and, and teachers and all that, and have, which is, ha has caused, caused them to shut off. Uh, so yeah, that, the, website, the website is gamingprivacy.org. Uh, I would bring it up, but it's just a bunch of blog posts. Uh, but if you're interested, that that's, there's information about it. Uh, and we're in the process, I just came from a workshop where we were working with the kids. So uh, we're just wrapping that up and now we're actually making the game. So it's gonna be interesting times. Excellent, thanks guys. Um, I do have questions prepared, but since we've, the demos, as I figured we get into, we get excited and keep talking about our examples. So I'll open the floor now. If anyone has any questions, immediately throw up your hand and I don't see anything right away. So I will throw, oh, we do have one already. How long is a piece of string? <laughs> how, how, how expensive is a car? Uh, so uh, game pricing, I, we get asked this a lot. I mean, I do anyway. I don't know about you guys. But uh, you know, uh, the cost of a game is dependent on lots of factors. Um, production values could be one of them. So did we not have a conversation about this, actually, <laughs> at Planet and Focus? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, okay, right. So, um, you know, production values can be a big part of it. Um, you know, if the artwork is really hard to produce or if it's got a really super lush and complicated soundscape, that's just going to add. It's the same kind of considerations, probably, I wouldn't know, that go into filmmaking. Um, and then, you know, it's like, what's, so there's, it's what's the scope? What's the scope of the project? It dictates part of the price. So, you probably, you're just looking for a price range. So, 5,000 bucks if a kid in his basement does it for you, $50,000 if my company does it for you. Um, can, it depends on the scope, right? Um, you know, it does the, the CMF gets stuff in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, there's a Bell Low Budget Production Fund. I think you guys have heard a lot about this uh, summit. So it's 75K or lower, I think. Uh, that's a pretty good budget for a game. You could probably do something pretty good for that. Yeah, just added it with Tony. I know as a producer myself, I've commissioned with developers, and it literally ranges anywhere from, I mean, five to ten gets really quick little point clip, uh, uh, 
click game, but then if you want to do like a big multiplayer element, you start looking at it to more like the 200,000, 250,000 yeah, range if you're doing is, complex. Platform so. is also a consideration, so it's pretty hard to make, well, I mean, a lot of people could argue with this, but it's hard to make a decent iPhone or iPad game for under, say, like $25,000. Um, you're probably looking at more like 30 to 50. Um, a web game is usually cheaper to produce by virtue of the production values not being so intense, but as soon as you start adding video and photographic elements and all that stuff, then it just keeps getting more and more expensive. And if there's certain technical considerations, does it need to be location aware? Does it need to be multiplayer? Is there a database involved? Cha-ching, 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 right? So. <clears throat> Uh, well, we've been uh, we've been taking the approach we've been taking with kids is actually to teach them basic game design skills. So they're co-creating the game, and I mean that. I mean in reality, that means that they're they're not they're not they're not really you know co-game designers on the level of like they're you know as a professional co-game designer would be. Uh, but they, you know we taught them enough and we involved them enough. That they're they are they they are directly informing um, the game and, and not in the sense of just giving us information, but actually looking at the game and saying this this does or does not speak to to you know my my experience. A couple of the games you might have made at Sin City, which came out what, about 20, 25 years ago, which I thought was one of the few games that was actually educational. Um, what? Uh, what improvements are there in terms of concept rather rather than in uh, the quality of, of uh, graphics and you know uh, and sound? Are, uh, what's the difference between the games that are being created now as an ed for educational purposes as opposed to uh, what came before? I mean Mario. I mean that's my kids playing Mario. Uh, that's the best. We actually listen to remixes of that stuff all the time. Uh, maybe I could just jump in real quick, which is technology affords us a few things today that we didn't have 25 years ago. So location awareness, um, stuff like motion detection, and uh, you know, these days an Xbox, $200 Xbox appliance can look at your skeleton and know what shape you are, that's pretty exciting. Um, and it affords some interesting opportunities for game designers and for players. Um, the medical field, right? Um, yeah, actually, that is true, actually. Yeah, there's lots of applications for it that people didn't expect, but in terms of um, new technologies anyway, there's certainly more interesting applications of technology. So yeah, but, yeah, but what's new in concept? Oh, well, yeah. I, I, what, I think one thing that's, that's really big these days that, uh, that you can take advantage of is the fact that game study has become a field. It didn't used to, it was in the field. Now there's, now there's people studying the way games work, and there's people, in fact, studying in Toronto uh, how games, uh, how, ed how education works within a game, and how, how games mirror the, the, um, the process of learning. So, I mean, if you're, if, you know, you can really take advantage of, of some of that learning. I think as well, like with something like SimCity, there was an implicit politic that wasn't sort of, it was just sort of uh, released as kind of like an educational slash entertainment product. Uh, and these days, I think much in the same way document, documentaries have kind of uh, been understood to have a kind of um, uh, perspective or bias or whatever. And doc modern documentaries would play with that and kind of um, play against type or, you know, uh, do those types of things. Um, uh, some of the more modern kind of simulators, um, whether it be McDonald's by Mall Industria or, or other, other ones like that, um, they, there is an explicit politic that they sort of work with. Um, 
Uh, often, like in the case of Mall Industria, an, 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 an unapologetic one in the sense of um, it's, it's a clear kind of um, political diatribe in some respects. Um, but I would argue that it's a much deeper one because uh, it shows the systemic kind of connections in a way that um, you know a, a, a chance at a, at a at a rally doesn't. And I, I think I, I would uh, I would I mean as far as one of the biggest things that you're able to do, of course, is how how massively multiplayer things have gotten as well. I think that's opened a massive new arena of things. But I think even more important, I think it's it's almost like audience palette is is changing. I mean, my my whole thing is is because um, I'm I'm deep into comics, and I mean for years it just stagnated, at least in North America, where comic books it was a genre, it was not a medium, it was just superhero, and that's all the expectation was. And I think. Uh, the exciting thing now is that that's changed, and, and you know now where where graphic novels go there, and, and you're able to reach a totally different audience. And I think that's the same thing with games. That's kind of the exciting thing about it, as much as anything else, is that you've got it's, it's breaking away. I mean, sure, it's still it's still a little bit more locked into like you know the first person shooter and whatnot, but but uh, the concepts and parameters of, of of what a game can be are completely changing. And I think the biggest thing is. It even is also just the technology, the affordability of the technology, so that you know now you're you're able to have single authors doing things and that that you couldn't do, you know, when you need a full team or you have you know larger constraints. I mean, I've gravitated first to, I moved into film when I when it, as it became more affordable because I thought it was the, the beat medium you could get the closest to your vision with, and, and then graphic novels. That's why I'd be so excited about it, and I think games is kind of becoming that way too. If your if your expectations are what types of stories you're trying to do are are realistic, I think that you're able to tell something. With a, with a pretty singular vision. What's a, what's a key lesson that you each have? Like, if you, I had you guys all thinking about it, but for this room of filmmakers looking at if they're thinking about moving into working with a game producer or starting to collaborate more in games, what's like that one really core piece of advice that, that you've got for them to keep in mind? Go first. Uh, I've already given it, which is the, um, uh, the comparison I made with uh, showing me more powerful than telling, interacting being uh, more powerful than, than showing. So uh, that's what I would, I would sort of I think on, on my side it would be to uh, distill it to its simplest, simplest form and, and uh, I think, yeah, keeping in mind time. I don't, I don't think you can get a lot, of, a lot of time, you can't get an audience for more than two minutes. I was going to say that, so I'll change mine. Uh, <laughs> mine would be uh, try to find a technology partner um, that you can consult with on scope and budget, uh, because often we get approached with a, someone by someone who hasn't looked at those things from the people who would actually build it. Um, so you need to know from that standpoint what you're getting yourself into before you decide what the budget or, or scope should be. Uh, a big thing for us is learning not to lead with technology. It's very easy to fall into uh, a bit of a trap these days in terms of uh, wanting to make something for the latest and greatest technology because it, I mean, it, it does, it, it's good buzz, it's, it's, it's a good thing to put on you know, the press release, uh, but oftentimes it is just the wrong thing for what you're trying to do. Uh, so you just you know, learn to be very careful with that. I think we have room for another question. One thing that's different, I think, with games is that you often have your pre-development, then your development, and then your production. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit briefly about what those phases are. Um, and is pre-development just purely paper, and then development is really a prototype? And is there a kind of standard format? And maybe are they long periods? It's a pretty big, uh, pretty big topic to cover. I mean, uh, even in the terminology you use, like I wouldn't have used that terminology. So I'm, I'm, since I do work with people in film and TV a fair bit, I try to translate in my head, but I think there has, actually has to be an effort on both sides. So, I mean, I guess what we, we might call it early stage development or pre-production, which is just like gathering, you know, a business case, like what's this thing gonna be, what's the scope, maybe doing some pre, you know, market uh, research or focus testing or whatever. Um, you know, that's where you get your high concept, um, and uh, then you get more into, you know, for, for funders, they want to see a so-called design document, but they actually don't really want to see a real design document the way we would understand it. That, that's like a 250-page <laughs> monstrosity that nobody understands, so um, I think, you know, for, say, like, Bell Development Fund, you can actually do that material. Um, do that design document, maybe not the full 250 page one because that'll be paid for under the production budget, um, but you could certainly do a 50 page uh, high level game design document that anybody could understand. 
Uh, but it's usually important to start at least from that basis. But I think everyone's production cycle is going to be different. I don't know if there's really that much of a template we can apply to game development, um, although these guys could prove me wrong on that. Yeah, one of the things that, that is, is markedly different from um, other mediums with, with game development is, is the iterative kind of approach. Um, iteration is incredibly important with, um, with game development. One of the reasons is, is because um, one of the great things about it is that um, uh, the thing I was talking about, like in terms of um, interacting kind of um, uh, sort of really kind of like uh, engaging your, your audience's brain, you need to keep that person uh, continually interacting. It actually requires like uh, uh, a game mechanic that is really compelling. If you don't have that, people won't play for more than five or six seconds sometimes. So your core thing has to be a compelling game mechanic, and that doesn't necessarily need to be a jumping thing like Mario. Um, you know, it, it, there's, there's, like, it's, it's a really broad kind of spectrum of things it could be, but basically um, a kind of a, a core thing with, with game development is getting a kind of a game mechanic that you can kind of rough in really quickly and, um, and, and build around the mechanic rather than, uh, say, assets like uh, video or, um, or even concept or story or any of those things. Um, if your mechanic isn't giving an inter like a interactivity kind of um, a positive feedback loop to your, the person that's playing, they're not going to put the work into it because, you know, video games, um, uh, for all that they get maligned for being kind of like a mind-numbing kind of thing, actually require more active work than watching a documentary does or watching a, a, a movie or whatever because there is that kind of uh, actual um, input the player has to be putting into it. So um, uh, players are accustomed to uh, to a, a minimum of, of kind of a mechanic that is compelling. So, so that's kind of a key thing. And I mean, you can, you, you can sort of look at something that looks really bare bones, much like, say, uh, a cartoonist could look at like a sketch of like a page in a graphic novel and say, well, that's, yeah, that's working really well. And to an, to an average um, person who reads graphic novels even, or a person who isn't, sort of schooled in that, they're not going to see that and see what's, you know, the, they're not going to see the sketch and understand um, the kind of potential beneath it. But I think that's why if you have a game designer um, that you trust and that you work with, um, uh, you can kind of rough in that, that game mechanic in an early stage. And once that's, once that's sort of working, then all the other stuff can kind of accrue around it. And unfortunately, I have to end it there because it's uh, we're at time. Thank you, Jim, Alex, Tony, and David very much. And I think we're transitioning to the pitch session. Let's see what we can do.